Uh, okay, I want you to think about a standard allocation problem. Uh, so we have uh, a seller of a single object and a bunch of potential buyers, okay? And what's the traditional mechanism and approach to this problem where we would just assume that this seller um, controls the entire interaction between these agents within the mechanism, okay? And that determines the allocation of the object. So in a sense, the, the mechanism is the game played by the agents. Okay, in practice, things are maybe not that simple. So here's a quote from Paul Milgram, my advisor. The game is really always bigger than you think, okay? Uh, so typically, this mechanism will actually be embedded in some larger market game that may well be beyond the direct control of the designer, okay? And in, in particular, by allocating the object to uh, a, you know, an, an agent in this mechanism, the designer will often create an aftermarket, okay? Which I'm going to think about in this talk as just a, an exogenous Bayesian game played between the winner of the auction and some third-party market participants, okay? Couple of examples, if, if this mechanism is a spectrum auction, for example, then those bidders are typically gonna be you know, telecom companies. And they engage in all sorts of interactions after the, after the auction is concluded. For example, maybe they will negotiate over leasing agreements uh, using the spectrum with future entrants to the industry. Okay. Different example, uh, financial markets, okay? If you have an OTC market, this mechanism could be a trading platform where bidders are financial dealers now, dealers don't just keep the assets and consume them. They actually typically will try to resell them in the aftermarket to some other investors. All right, whatever the aftermarket is, an assumption for this analysis is going to be that the designer cannot just design the aftermarket and she cannot contract directly with the third parties. However, she can do one thing, which is she can disclose information that was elicited uh, in the mechanism from the agents in order to influence the aftermarket indirectly by changing the information structure, hence the equilibrium and outcomes in the aftermarket. So again, coming back to my two examples, suppose I'm this third party in the aftermarket. I negotiate over leasing agreements with a guy who bought Spectrum. Of course, I'm gonna be interested in knowing how much this guy paid for the Spectrum because this is gonna be informative about their value. This will help me in negotiations. And therefore, the auctioneer has to make a very conscious choice of how much of this data to make available to the outsiders, okay? In financial markets, the same principle, the transparency of the trading mechanism determines how much information is available to players in this resale stage. And so the goal for this project is to just understand um, how to design mechanisms when they are followed by an exogenous aftermarket with particular emphasis on how transparent those mechanisms should be. All right, to make things concrete, I'm gonna work with a simple model today. It's a simplified version. There's just one seller with a single good, a single agent in the mechanism who has a private information theta about the value for the object, and there's going to be a single third party in the aftermarket with value V, okay? Now, there's a version of the revelation principle. We can look at direct mechanisms here. So what's gonna happen is that the agent will report a type uh, to the mechanism, and she will receive uh, the good of some probability X, that's the allocation rule, and pay some transfer T. So, so far, that's completely standard, right? The novel part is that now, conditional on the object being allocated, the designer is going to draw a signal S, from a distribution pi, so, so this pi is the disclosure, it's part of the mechanism, condition on the report of the agent, and reveal that signal publicly, okay? So that's the part that the designer controls. The second stage of the game is this exogenous aftermarket, which I'm going to uh, take to be very simple for this talk. So the third party observes that signal, whatever the signal is, updates beliefs according to Bayes' rule, and makes an optimal take a live it offer to the agent to try to purchase the object from the agent. The agent can say yes or no. So the goal for the designer is to, you know, taking this exogenous aftermarket is given, optimize over direct mechanisms to maximize, let's say, a weighted sum of surplus and revenue, okay? Now, I'll, I'm gonna give you a hint of the general model. So pretty much everything I'm gonna say extends to a case when you could have N agents in the mechanism, so it could be a, a proper auction, as long as it's just the winner who interacts in the aftermarket, okay? And really the way I, I want to, you to think about the aftermarket is just a black box that spits out a continuation payoff for that winner that depends not just on the type of the winner, but also on the posterior belief about the type induced by the mechanism, okay? Uh, one quick clarification. Um, this idea that the data revealed by the mechanism can be used by outsiders, this is one of the motivations for differential privacy, which you're probably familiar with. We've seen a talk on Tuesday about this. Um, this is a different idea in that privacy here is not a goal in itself. It's just one of possible designs, okay? You could, but, but in principle, the designer could actually prefer to have a lot of transparency. For example, in, in this resale case, if, you're, if you care about surplus, you actually want full transparency. This will actually give you the first best 
uh, because then resale would be fully efficient. All right, uh, just a couple of points about the structure of this problem. Um, so if you, if you forget about the aftermarket, that's just a standard uh, Myerson's type problem and we know how to solve this. You have a couple of incentive constraints here, we know how to handle them. On the other hand, if you forget about the fact that the designer needs to elicit this information from the agent, just assume the designer has this information, then this becomes an information design problem, okay? Where the designer will just reveal information about theta to the third party under commitment to induce the desired behavior in the aftermarket subject to obedience constraints. And that, that's called information design. It's also very well understood now. The problem here is that I really need to design those two things jointly, okay? I need to design the mechanism and the information dis disclosure together and there are complicated interactions between the incentive constraints and the obedience constraints. To, to put it bluntly, um, if you disclose too much information about the agent, the agent will not want to tell you the truth. So you have to somehow incentivize the agent. All right, uh, what's, the, what's the approach that I'm gonna take? Uh, it turns out this is one of those problems where it's very hard to find uh, an optimal mechanism and moreover, even if you can find it, it often turns out to be quite complicated. So instead I'm going to do something that will be very familiar to this audience. I'm gonna look at a, a simpler class of mechanisms uh, called cutoff mechanisms. One of their key properties will be that they will actually always incentivize the agent to report the type truthfully. And because they will solve this incentive issue, I will actually be able to apply some relatively standard uh, information design techniques to find or to say something about the optimal mechanism. Right? And at the end, I will provide some conditions under which this restriction is actually without loss of generality. Okay, so that's the, that's the plan. All right, definition. Uh, so I want give you a formal definition. It's a bit too complicated for such a talk, but intuitively what's gonna happen is this. Um, first, if you have a non-decreasing allocation rule, it's easy to see that there always exists a random variable called the cutoff, I'm gonna call it the cutoff, so that the agent wins precisely when she reports a type above the cutoff. All right, so this is easiest to understand in examples. If I have just one agent in the mechanism, uh, then a cutoff is just a random reserve price. Okay, you get the object if your type is above that random reserve price. In an auction, what is the threshold I have to outbid to win? Well, it's just the highest competing bid. So the cutoff is the highest competing bid. All right, so now what's the cutoff mechanism? It's a mechanism that has a non-decreasing allocation rule. And the signal that I sent, or to be precise, the signal distribution, only depends on the realization of the cutoff. Okay. So for example, if I'm running a second price auction, I disclose a price that the winner paid, this is gonna be a cutoff mechanism because what's the price in a second price auction? By definition, this is the second highest bid, that's the cutoff. So this mechanism just reveals the cutoff, it's, it's okay. I could also disclose it with noise, that would still be a cutoff mechanism. On the other hand, a first price auction with disclosure of the price is not a cutoff mechanism because now the price is actually the first bid, which is not the cutoff. So I now disclose something else, this is not a cutoff mechanism. And one maybe trivial point is that uh, information about the cutoff is going to be informative about the agent's uh, type, the winner's type, because I know by definition that the type must have been above the cutoff if, if the good was allocated. All right, um, one easy but important result is that you can always implement a cutoff rule. What do I mean by this? Well, give me any cutoff rule. Then for any prior distribution of types, for any evaluation of the third party, even for any aftermarket really, I will be able to find some prices in the mechanism such that this will be a truthful mechanism. Why is that? Uh, well, it's very intuitive. In this mechanism, the, the report of the winner doesn't actually influence the signal, okay? The signal is determined by this exogenous cutoff, so the, the winner cannot really influence or manipulate uh, the beliefs uh, that the mechanism is going to induce. And this is very analogous to VCG mechanism. So why a VCG mechanism is truthful? Because conditional on the allocation, the report of the, of the winner doesn't influence how much the winner pays. In a cutoff mechanism conditional on the allocation, the winner's report doesn't influence the signal that is gonna be sent. Now you might think this is a restrictive class, there must be lots of other truthful uh, mechanisms, and yes, there are, but none of those others, other mechanisms are actually robust, uh, robustly uh, truthful. So it turns out that if you take an allocation disclosure rule and you want it to be always implementable in this sense, there actually has to be a cutoff rule. So if you disclose information other than information about the cutoff, at least sometimes for some distributions and aftermarkets, this cannot be a truthful mechanism. So this first result, you can interpret it or say that it's with slight abuse of notation or, or terminology is that this is kind of a, a class of mechanisms defined by being implementable in the worst case. Okay. Uh, now I want to shift gears and talk about optimality a little bit. 
just to be clear, this is gonna be optimality in a standard economic sense, so optimality with respect to some fixed uh, Bayesian belief of the designer. And I will first uh, think about an auxiliary problem, a simpler one, where I'm gonna fix the allocation rule and only optimize over disclosure rule. So this is like saying I'm running a second price auction, but I get to choose how much information to reveal about the, the second highest bid. Now, um, once I fixed the allocation, I also fixed a cutoff here, the second highest bid. And as long as I only disclose information about that cutoff, potentially noisy, but about the cutoff, then everything is gonna be fine in terms of the IC constraints. This is the previous result I've shown you, right? So all that I have left in terms of the design problem is really this information design problem, how much information to disclose. So the, the sender, the designer is a sender now who has access to information about the cutoff and discloses it to the third party. Uh, so it's a persuasion problem and we actually know how to solve this problem. So now we can apply known results. So conceptually, I wanna uh, explain this in a graph. On the x-axis, I'm gonna wanna think about posterior beliefs over the cutoff that can be induced by, by different signals. On the y-axis, it's the payoff to the designer. So if you fix the objective function for every belief I can induce about the cutoffs, I get some payoff as the designer. If I don't disclose any information, I just uh, get the payoff determined you know, at, my prior, at my prior belief. I'm not sure if you can see this, okay? And now uh, what we know, this is a famous paper by Kamenis and Gensko from a couple of years ago, and it's, it's a result that goes back to Aman Mashler's earlier paper. The best you can do with information disclosure is the concave closure of this function, right, which is the smallest concave upper bound. All right, so let me take this result and prove the following theorem. If there's only one agent in my mechanism um, and the designer now optimizes jointly over allocation and disclosure rule, then the optimal mechanism will actually send no signals. It will offer privacy to the agent. And I can actually prove this for you uh, using this, this illustration. So, so far I've argued that with just information disclosure, you can get from the black line, which is the payoff if you don't reveal any information, to the red line, the concave closure. But now I also allow the designer to choose the allocation rule. What does it mean to choose an allocation rule in a single agent problem? It's just choosing the reserve price and the reserve price is the cutoff. So by choosing the allocation rule, you get to choose any distribution over cutoffs you want. M meaning any prior belief over cutoffs can be just directly chosen by the designer. I get to choose any point in that space. I'll choose the one that maximizes my payoff. But notice that at the global maximum, the concave closure of a function has to actually coincide with the function itself. Which is to say I can achieve this optimal payoff without any communication, without sending any signal. Right. And what really has happened here is that I've shown that this design problem is, is essentially a, a persuasion problem where I get to choose as the sender the prior distribution of the state. And if I can choose the prior, there's no point in sending signals to induce posterior beliefs. I can just induce my favorite posterior belief by choosing the prior directly. And using this general result, I can now uh, easily uh, show that with this uh, simple resale example, um, the optimal mechanism is going to be to set a reserve price uh, where the reserve price, of course, will depend on my objective function, depending on whether I put more weight on revenue or, or surplus maximization. But in any case, I don't reveal any additional information uh, about the agent's type. Notice that it's, it's not a fully private mechanism and that I know at least that the agent's type is above the, the, the cut of the R here, but I don't send any additional signals. Uh, now, I wanna mention that this result is not true of multiple agents. Uh, so if you have more than one agent in the mechanism, then the optimal cutoff mechanism will actually often require some non-trivial information disclosure. Okay? And I don't have time to explain why, but I invite you to kind of um, walk through my reasoning in the previous case and try to see which, which part of the analysis doesn't go through. And of course, there is much more uh, on this in the paper. All right, so I want to talk at the end a little bit about when cutoff mechanisms are actually without loss of generality. Okay? And I, can only have, um, I only have time to give you a flavor of the result. Um, but again, you can look at, in, in the paper. So I, let me fix an allocation and disclosure rule, x and pi. And I, I'm gonna make three assumptions. First, it's strongly implementable. What is this? Well, it's, it's a strengthening of dominant strategy implementability, which will only have bite if the mechanism is random. So if the designer is flipping a coin in the mechanism, I want the agents to report truthfully, even if they don't trust that the designer is correctly randomizing, even if they think the designer is using a, a biased coin. Right? And this is actually related to the work that uh, Sheng Wu with Mohammed uh, has done, uh, this is a paper from, that got uh, the best paper award at DC last year. I want some regularity conditions that I 
uh, that I want to talk about. They are relatively restrictive, but not very interesting. And finally, this is the key uh, assumption. I want my aftermarket to be submodular. What is a submodular aftermarket? It's one where the payoff of the winner, which is a function of her type and the posterior belief about her type, is in fact submodular in those two variables, which is to say that the change in utility from increasing the posterior belief in the aftermarket is in fact decreasing in my actual type. Right? It's a lot to take in, but for example, resale aftermarkets are submodular. So the example will satisfy that condition. Okay? If these three conditions hold, then in fact anything that you know, satisfies them has to be a cutoff rule. So it's in fact without loss of generality to look at cutoff mechanisms. All right, I guess I'm probably running out of time, so let me uh, give some concluding remarks. So I proposed a model of mechanism design with aftermarkets in which transparency of the mechanism becomes an essential part of the design. I talked about cutoff mechanisms, and one comment I wanna make for this audience specifically, especially given the nature of this session, is that I think that, or I believe that there's a lot of um, interesting research questions in the middle ground between the CS style, or the worst case analysis, and the more economic style uh, Bayesian optimization. And I, I think of, of, of the cutoff mechanisms as being just one example of something that's sort of in between those two approaches, because I've shown you that um, cutoff mechanisms are essentially characterized by being implementable even in the worst case, okay? But then once I had this smaller class with this property, I found the optimal mechanism by optimizing against some fixed Bayesian belief of the designer, which you can think of as a conjecture or the most likely scenario, okay? And this is just, just one example, but I, I do encourage this community especially, I think this community is very well equipped to, to uh, address this problem of exploring uh, the middle ground between those two uh, extreme approaches to, to mechanism design. Okay. Thank you, I'm ready for questions. So. Um, so I always thought about the multi-product monopolist problem, which of course has received a lot of attention, uh, because this is one of the problems where the fully Bayesian solution, as we understand, is extremely complicated. Um, yes, even the additive case. I mean, we've seen a talk yesterday about this, uh, but I think this is a great problem where uh, kind of both of the extreme approaches give us kind of paradoxical answers, and probably something in between would give us the answer that's much closer to what we need from, a, from an implied perspective. 